Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Polinoff. I'm the uh, editor and uh, chief cook and bottle washer, as they say, of mptrader.com. And you should be seeing the, uh, the upper portion of the front page of my website, mptrader.com. Uh, I've been, just by way of background, well, I'd like to thank David for in, inviting me to present today. Um, I, when I saw the subject of commodities and cannabis, uh, I kind of got a kick out of that because in 1982, I was hired by Smith Barney, Harris Upham uh, in New York City to be their New York commodities, commodities analyst. And that was almost 40 years ago, believe it or not. And that was at the peak of the commodity cycle. For two years, I was recruited as a very young guy to be a commodities analyst. And I was working in Washington, D.C. after graduating from Georgetown University in a foreign service school. And one day, the head of this consulting firm comes in to my little cubicle and he says, listen, I have, I have the Wall Street Journal on the line and they want to know what to make of the freeze in the Florida orange crop in, this was in February 1980. I didn't know anything about frozen concentrated orange juice. So I said, what do you want me to tell him? So he said, well, just wing it. You're a smart guy. And he walked, <laughs> he walked out. So there I am talking to the Wall Street Journal and I'm winging it, telling him that the, you know, the temperatures were, were below freezing for more than like eight hours and the crop, half the crop froze, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I managed to wing my way through it. And I was... From the next morning on, I was chased relentlessly by every headhunter in New York and Chicago who thought they needed the next great commodity analyst. Whether that was me or not remained to be seen, of course, because I was like 22 years old. And I ended up going to New York Smith, uh, to work at Smith Barney, and it had to be right at the top of the commodity cycle. So there I was in 1982 watching gold peak and every other commodity, soybeans and you name it, peak. And here we are 40 years later. And we are now maybe in the next commodity super cycle. And so uh, I'll get to that in a second, but um, I'd just like to just show you what goes on in my site, what I do all day, every day. So you get into the trading room. That's not really a trading room. It's a discussion room. And it starts way down here with my first, uh, my first update of the day. And it goes from there. And I update probably three times an hour. And and I explained things, and this was the introduction. Last, this was the introduction to this morning's first, first update. And I usually start off doing some sort of broad, broad market commentary. And you can, you can uh, enlarge the charts and see what I'm talking about. And a lot of it is very technical. I don't make it esoteric technical, I explain myself. And I think anybody who's uh, a member would agree that uh, it, this is not esoteric stuff. I do a lot of explaining. And then I go into something, uh, usually uh, one to three more things, uh, names of, of either uh, indexes, uh, stocks, commodities, et cetera, et cetera, Bitcoin, uh, usually in the early in the morning before the open. And to this morning, I wanted to loop back around and talk about Moderna. And, and so there's an annotated chart, which I slave over. And then I put in some of my commentary and uh, our, our subscribers and members, they 
they put in their own comments, they question my comments, they <clears throat> add information, and it's uh, and, and it's uh, a nice um, uh, give and take throughout the entire day. And anything is open for discussion. For instance, uh, just to put a fine point on it, someone asked me about uh, what what I thought of the Boston Beer or you know Sam Adams uh, chart situation. So I wrote what I wrote. Um, and so uh, it had a gigantic, like 65% correction. And now uh, is it turning or not? And we discussed that and we'll loop back around uh, tomorrow or the next day or whenever anybody wants to discuss it or anything else for that matter that's up here. Up at the top is a coverage list. And this is all, these are all the names I cover in a particular day and every day going back like uh, 20 days. And so you can always see what uh, my perception of things were, uh, is and was at the time I covered it. Okay, so enough about the site, enough marketing. So let's, let's go to, um, uh, let's see. Okay, so let's start the commodity part, portion of this presentation. And I wanna start with a non-commodity. I wanna start with 10-year yield. And the reason why I start with 10-year yield, let me go to, uh, by the way, I'm using TradeStation. Uh, I've used them for years. And it's a very flexible, at least for my purposes, it enables me to do just about everything I wanna do, uh, technically. Okay, so here's, this is a chart of, of monthly 10 year yield that goes back to 1981. And I picked that for a reason and the reason you already know. This is pretty much when I started my career with interest rates at 16%. And here we are 40 years later, pretty much, uh, with interest rates at about a half a percent when they, when they hit their low. So you might, you might understand, anybody who follows commodities, you might understand that if interest rates were coming down, and I, I get it that they're being manipulated and suppressed by the Fed, but not, not for all of this time. I mean, uh, the great financial crisis was in here, 2009. So from here over 2009 back to 1981, they weren't particularly suppressed. Uh, this is the suppression part of the chart in here. Uh, and I would say, whoops, sorry. I would say that what we're looking at is uh, three, 3.6, 3.7% down to near zero. And that's, that's the suppression part of the chart in terms of yield. So it's no coincidence that perhaps commodities didn't fare too well over the last 40 years, give or take some intervening bounces. So 10-year yield though, the question is, is 10-year yield bottoming? Now, <clears throat> I think it is. Of course, I thought it was here and I thought it was definitely here. And then, you know, the the uh, pandemic hit and more manipulation by the Fed. And so who knows if it's bottoming, it's only bottoming if the Fed takes its boot off the neck of the market or if the Fed loses control of the treasury market, which I mean, anything's possible these days. So, so that's a picture of yield and yield is not telling us, Fed notwithstanding, Yield is not particularly telling us that we're in a super cycle up move in commodities. But if our transient inflationary spiral here, it becomes less transient and more permanent, then it may just be that the Fed does lose control and, and 
we reconvene in six months and we're at 4%. That would be something. And there are so many things out there that could create a combustion uh, that the Fed had better not lose control of, of things because who knows where rates could go. Okay, so that's the rate side of it. And then let's take everyone's, I think everyone's basic gauge of, well, what do I look at if I want to look at a general increase in, in the price rate, in the, in the price level? Uh, you can look at CPI, and we all know that's a phony number. We could look at um, even the Atlanta Fed's numbers, or we could look at the uh, PCE, personal consumption expenditure side of the ledger that Greenspan said was the Fed's favorite and may still be which shows 5%. Uh, well, we know that uh, crude oil has gone up an awful lot. And, you know, you could see, I mean, there was a, back in April of 2020, I mean, it went negative, but let's, let's, uh, let's use the chart as the gauge here. It went from 650 to uh, $80, basically. And I don't know how many hundred percent that is without pounding my calculator, but it's more than the 5% annualized rate that the uh, PCE is telling us commodities will go up or uh, general prices will go up this year. So if I use this chart, which you see back in 2008, uh, oil hit $145 a barrel and went into a massive bear market and it bottomed down here or, or spiked low V bottom down here. Well, now you can make the case that not only is oil had a massive run, that since 2015-16, you can make a case that we could call this technically consolidation. Uh, well, sorry, accumulation. And the accumulation now has forced the price structure above what I consider to be uh, a key level, which is the $77 level. So if in fact that is true, this is accumulation in a theoretical sense, and the price structure has now broken out, then all of this at some point in the future will end up here. In other words, this accumulation, let's call it $25 to $75 or a $50 move will end up above the breakout point, which means that we could be going to $100, if not higher. Now, in terms of the measurements here, yeah, I can come up with $130 to $150 a barrel. We were there once. We could go there again. And, you know, with all the convoluted, po the uh, geopolitics, and convoluted um, greening of America that is, uh, you know, you, we're all aware that, you know, probably in 20 years, there'll be no fossil fuel combustion engine vehicles, but it could take 10 years of those 20 years to get, I don't know, 5% of the population of the cars out there driven uh, electrically or, or battery operated or some other way. So what are we gonna do then in the next 10 years while we're making the transfer? You, we're going to need fuel. And this chart is telling us that there is not enough of it around and the demand is enormous if this chart is correct. So anyway, to be not to, not to belabor the issue, my first and next target based on this chart is 93.50. And that I think will end this leg. And then we'll go into some sort of, you know, uh, extended pullback. At least that's the way it's setting up right now. Uh, next, uh, before we go over to the general commodities, next, let's, let's look at the other part of the fuel situation, which to me is nat gas, because nat gas is cleaner and it is making up for or taking up the slack 
uh, the, the Goldman Sachs um, head of commodities was on CNBC today. And, you know, he made, he made the comment that, you know, the winds, the wind stopped blowing in, in the UK and in Europe and natural gas all of a sudden was demanded out of, out of control. And this chart is telling us that it's not done yet. This is uh, the U.S. side, and that gas is is headed much higher after this pullback. And I think maybe this pullback can get you back to the breakout point or close to it, 460, 461. And then I think it's going up here into the seven and a half area. Now, maybe that implies we're going to have a cold winter, like a really cold winter, like one of those polar vortex winters. That's Murphy's law for sure, because uh, you had two years ago down here, you had massive, massive overhang in natural gas. And, you know, Kramer would say every day that they were, you know, burning it off in, in, into the air because there was so much of it. Well, now you have just the opposite situation that that overhang has been worked off. And now demand is skyrocketing. If we have a cold winter or polar vortex, who knows where natural gas. So, so if, if the commodity cycle is picking up steam, uh, no pun intended, then it is because I think that it's the oil natural gas component that's going to drive it. And, you know, I just locked in a heating oil, heating oil for my home for the winter at 311, 310 a gallon. And last year I locked it in at 212. And that's that's locked in for the winter. And you know, now it's 350 right now. And so maybe I did a maybe, maybe I made a good bet, maybe I didn't. Uh, but it looks like it's going over four dollars, possibly to five. So that's why I did it. As far as a general commodity. Trend go, trends go, if we use the DB, DBC Commodity Tracking Fund Index, and this goes back to July of 2008, this is kind of like 14, 15 commodities of all different kinds that are put into an index, and this ETF tracks the index. This up leg is very similar to the up leg you just saw in oil, and uh, if I put up the list of what's in there, it's, there's probably... Uh, a, a high component of oil and heating oil and that gas in this index. Nonetheless, the question to me is how, how powerful is this move? Is this a, my, a major base? And then we're going to double the base and we're going to, it'll be 30 bucks next year or later this year. Uh, well, fourth quarter unlikely, but early next year. I don't know the answer to that. I do know this, though, that this level, 21 and a quarter, now we closed at 20.95 today after hitting two days ago, after hitting a high of 21.07. 21.25 represents a 50% recovery of this portion of the bear phase from 2008 to 2021. Uh, I'm sorry, 2020. That's wrong. Pandemic low was um, so 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 with this having already recovered fifty percent of this portion of the bear phase. If it takes this out, if and when it takes this out and sustains this level, then I think we're going a lot higher. Certainly into this into this resistance area at twenty five twenty seven from 21. So if you you should we should all be watching this DBC to see how this navig how the up move navigates this 21 and a quarter. Right now my sense is that there's a pretty good chance that it's it'll fail here, pull back to this breakout zone that stretches for 6 years and a pull back into the 191850 area 
and then the next upturn, that's when I, I think we need to really be concerned that it takes off. Uh, if it takes out 1789 on the downside, then I think uh, Powell's transient inflationary period may in fact be actually unfolding that commodities are moderating, but unless and until it gets through this uh, pullback low, we have to think the bullish, the bullish scenario is uh, in directional control. All right, so that's that's DBC. All right, so let's let's um, let's go now to the U.S. dollar because uh, the dollar we can't we can't really talk about commodities without talking about the dollar. And where did I put the chart? <clears throat> okay, well, I thought I had it in here. So let's go to the videotape. You'll get to see how, how all this stuff works. So you go in and you see, I have to pull up foreign exchange. And it pulls up all these charts that I have from foreign exchange. And here it is. So let's copy and go back here and paste it in here so we can keep the continuity of this. All right. So this is a dollar index chart that goes back to 2012, 10 years. And to the naked eye, this is uh, this is the opposite of what we just saw in the commodity charts. You know, these are all weekly charts. I, I think the big picture is pretty much what we have to focus on in an hour. So we know we kind of get our bearings. And then what I do is I use the big picture, weekly, monthly, big picture, daily, big picture. And then I, then I, uh, I uh, drill down into uh, into the four hour, two hour, hourly, uh, 15 minute, five minute, and just to see how all these patterns are developing within each other. So that's my kind of methodology when I when I look at these charts to get a real sense as to where they are and where the dominant forces are in direction. Okay, so so basically I I think that the dollar since 2015 or six years has been putting in a distribution top, quite the opposite of the accumulation bottom that we were discussing in crude oil and, and in the, the commodity index. So this is it and so in that in general, the dollar is inversely related to commodities, especially commodities. Most of them are still traded in dollars, even though um, the Iranians and the Russians and the Chinese would like to change that. And maybe if this chart breaks to the downside and really falls apart, maybe they'll be succeeding in changing uh, how much trade is done in dollars. But for now, it's a dollar-based uh, currency world. In any case, every day it seems like the dollar goes up, but when you put it in context, it's, you know, if we went from 103 to uh, 90 and it's recovered to uh, 94, it's gone, it's pulled back or it's recovered like 35, 40% of the move. And it, it looks to me like a bear market, a rally in a in a bear market, in a dominant bear trend. So that's why we have to be concerned here, or at least aware, so the hot of, of what the dollar is doing. Because if the dollar tanks one day and it starts to break down again, then if we're looking at, at something like this, then 
the dollar will will fulfill and complete this top and trigger a huge potential, a huge potential decline down into here. Now, I don't know what the world will look like down here, but along the way, we can be pretty sure that commodities will be acting pretty well. Uh, some, some equity sectors will be acting well for a while. <clears throat> The bond market will probably ha be having a real problem. Rates will be backing up and who knows what else. But if we just stick to what we're talking about, if the dollar breaks down, it triggers all sorts of, of other reactions and dominoes. And for the most part, I think commodities, oh, thank you. For the most part, uh, the commodity markets will be doing the inverse of what the dollar does. Now, the dollar, I had written here that <clears throat> at the end of, well, I guess about a week ago, a week and, and a half ago, the dollar hit its high at 94.50 and the daily sentiment index reading was 83. And that's overbought, but not extreme. So, the dollar probably has a little bit more in terms of sentiment before before it rolls over or it, or at least pulls back. And the next pullback will be critical to the overall picture uh, of, of this chart setup. So that's the dollar. And I know most of you want me to, oh, I clicked on coffee. Even coffee's going up. Uh, I mean, maybe this is a function of Brazil and uh, freeze and uh, disease in the crops. Who knows? But coffee has gone up a lot, like doubled. So if you're a coffee drinker like me and you like order good coffee <laughs> and that's a priority, well, we're going to be feeling it. It's already like $16, $18 a pound. And it's probably going up uh, higher. I don't know what the elasticity of coffee is. My elasticity is like, uh, I guess, I guess you can get me to pay 25 bucks a pound, <laughs> but I'm not going to be a happy camper, a reluctant camper at that point. So let's go over to, to gold because, <clears throat> uh, well, because it, it, it could have, should have, would have type of um, situation in gold. <clears throat> let's see. All right, let's go. We'll do gold futures, nearest futures. So this chart is a weekly chart of nearest gold futures. It goes back to 2002. Now for me, I realized that gold we all think that gold is the relic that was sensitive to inflation, geopolitical uh, events, black swans, who knows? But gold is just dead as a doornail. However, when you look at this chart, you say, wow, gold f for all the hatred and, and um, dismissal that gold has endured. It's only here. It's it's not like it's not like gold is down here because everybody hates it. No, gold has had a very uh, orchestrated and um, tame pullback off of its accumulation breakout, you know, accumulated between 2013, 2019, broke out of 1550, went to 2100, and now here it is at 1750. If you didn't know better, the rhetoric, about, the rhetoric and the sentiment of gold is so bad. You would think that gold is back under $1,000 now and that it's just a pile of garbage. Well, 
everyone thinks it's a pile of garbage, but it's 1750 pile of garbage. So in other words, I don't know that we should dismiss gold out of hand and just ignore it. I'm happen to think, I happen to think that here's the pandemic low was 1677. We haven't even broken the pandemic low yet. Um, and I don't think we will. So gold, to me, this is, this is a huge accumulation period. This almost looks like a cup, to put a label on it, a cup with a handle. Here's the cup, here's the handle. And the handle is very mature. So the next up move, I'm thinking there will be another up move in gold one of these days. I don't know what will trigger it, but needless to say, the same thing that triggers a, a more than 5% or 6% correction in the stock market is probably the same thing that's going to make gold go <laughs> to this blue line at 2100 and then to 24 or 500. Uh, so I don't know what that is, but it's coming, I think. Now, if gold takes out this 16, you know, 70 area, then I think that, you know, it's got more problems than I'm willing to uh, identify and admit now. But gold is not in terrible shape. It's certainly not on anybody's radar, which to me, at some point, it's kind of every dog has its day. I don't know when this dog will have its day, but it, it, it unless it, it really does some serious damage down here. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, um, an accident on the upside waiting to happen. Let's put it that way. So that's gold. Now, if you think gold is an accident waiting to happen or just an accident for the time being, then silver, oh my God, silver is something to behold. Oh, but wait a minute, look at this. For all the hatred uh, that silver has in, engendered over the last, I don't know, year, really since it peaked in August, well, it peaked in August of 2020, and then it had that spike high in February of 21. But everyone said, silver is the place you have to be. Why? Well, here's why. Silver is the place you have to be because copper leads silver and copper did that after accumulating for mm, six years, six and a half years, copper went from a, I have more here, yeah. So copper went from a massive bear market in February of 2011, when all the metals peaked, here's the peak at 466, went down under two bucks. Um, but this was part of an accumulation pattern, accumulation period. And look, it just rocketed. And it looks like it's consolidating above this kind of support level. And it's about to take off again. Now, everyone, me included, thought that we're copper goes, silver will follow. Silver arguably should be even stronger than copper because it's part industrial and part precious. Well, neither the uh, precious part of it nor the uh, industrial part of it got that memo because this is silver and this is copper. So silver, let's see, this is February, August, February. So this is February of 21. And this is where copper consolidated, but look at what it's coming off of. This is enormous. So silver arguably has the same sort of pattern, but has had nothing like the upside in copper, but for all the hatred of cop of uh, silver, just like gold, and all the disappointment, and all the bleeding call options, I imagine that that occurred in the last six months, silver has come back pretty much to its breakout point. If 
we extend this and you know be a little creative with it right silver has come back to its breakout point so return to sender and now i'm thinking that silver looks like it could be could be in position to take off what will make that happen i don't know uh, of course if silver takes out you know the 20 and a half level or so uh, i might have to um, amend this analysis but right now as long as this 21 40 80 21 50 let's call it area holds then i'm thinking that maybe if you buy call options out on you know like slv uh, even though people a lot of people distrust the comex uh i'm not sure that that's right or wrong i really don't know i do know that <laughs> i'm one of the people who thinks that there's been a conspiracy against the precious metals by the big banks uh, and that's sort of analogous to the Fed suppressing interest rates. Um, and, uh, you know, they slapped JP Morgan and, uh, and uh, Morgan Stanley, I guess, on the wrist last year a few times for uh, manipulating uh, COMEX gold and silver. And, uh, but they still don't go up. And when they do go up, they get slammed right after. So I don't know that that's going to change. But if the chart, is true to form and both gold and silver are positioned to take off whether they will or not is another thing so um if you look at like slv calls out let's say two years like look at a 25 strike or a 30 strike plunk down the money and just forget about it because Silver is just too frustrating to look at every day. And uh, when it goes, it goes. Uh, so maybe that's an idea that, that uh, you know, we should all consider for, for silver. Um, because when it has, a, when it has uh, the green light, it will overtake gold like it did in, in the late uh, 1970s and the gold silver ratio go from 100 plus to 50 uh, and the whole cycle will start again. Now, maybe that, maybe, maybe it won't happen because Bitcoin came along. Uh, I, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, so here's Bitcoin, all right, now, there's a lot of lines in this chart. There's a daily chart, not a weekly, a daily. Goes back to when, to March of 2020, the, the pandemic lows when Bitcoin, based on the futures, was 7,600. And then it had a minor rally to 65,500. And well, that was the first up leg of something, I think. And here is this huge accumulation pattern down to 28,800. And then you know that we went up to 53, back to 40,000 and held. And the stars are aligning for, well, maybe this is the end of a correction of this. And if there's an equidistant move, just, just to, you know, to fantasize, you know, if there's an equidistant move, you got uh, what 7,500 to 6,500. <laughs> That's like uh, 60,000, 50,000. Uh, so this will get you to uh, up here somewhere. So I don't know that that's the case, but I know one thing is that Bitcoin has been a hell of a lot more responsive to whatever's going on in the world, whether it's politics, economics, um, you know, market innuendo, uh, speculation. Now, if this move in Bitcoin from 7,600 to 65,000 was uh, 
the speculation froth crazy what are they doing no one knows no one is this is just pure speculation we're not gonna be able to call a move to 90,000 um, or 100,000 or higher speculation. We're going to have to call it something that's, uh, I think, more substantial than speculation. Like, wow, <laughs> this thing has reasons to be doing what it's doing, even though no one really knows the reasons. It's just supply and demand, I guess. And the supply of Bitcoins are, uh, is not being produced rapidly enough for the amount of people who want to own this thing or want to put some assets in it, even though they're not sure what it is, which I guess leads me to throw in that disclaimer that this might be the biggest Ponzi scheme in the history of the planet. Uh, but I don't know. I really don't know. Technically, it's ironic to me that when silver looks like it wants to go up and gold look li looks like it wants to go up, it always fails. Even though the chart setups could be just as compelling as this one. This one though, Bitcoin actually performs technically in a very reasonable way, in a very true way which to me is all I ask for. So the stock market doesn't act technically, especially on the downside, because there are, there are forces that are underneath it. Gold and silver don't act technically true to the upside because there are forces that are headwinds. This is the wild west and it seems to and it, it does act very technical. So for me, until you know the powers that be get involved and screw it up, to me, this is a very analyzable quote unquote commodity. And maybe it is the gauge of inflation that gold isn't. I don't really know, but I just throw it out there. So we've done oil, copper, silver, gold, uh, DBC. Uh, let me just put in, let me just show you DBA because DBA is the agricultural component of this, you know, grains and, uh, you know, livestock. And it's an interesting chart. And, you know, listen, uh, it's, it's controlling foodstuffs. So grain and, you know, bread and, you know, well, same story. Let me condense it. We'll go back. This is a huge base being built. You know, and it, it just, you know, this is, uh, what year is this? 2011, when a lot of commodities peaked, went down for 10 years, nine, 10 years. And now it looks like it's ready to break out and go crazy. Uh, now, it already broke out once. First time was down here at 167080 off of a bottom at 13 and a half or 1315 or 1330. It consolidated. Now it looks like, excuse me, it wants to take out the next level, which is like $20. And if it does, it's it's going higher. It's probably going up here to $24. And so will bread prices. So will pork and steak and whatever else is in that index. So there you have it. Uh, it, would be a, it would be unusual if this was looking anything different than it looks, given the other charts we've looked at. And um, one more, just because, because, <laughs> is this one. This is DBB, which is the uh, base metals index like zinc and iron ore and copper and 
some other stuff, lots of other stuff um, that are considered to be industrial metals. Well, look at the giant base on this one. Uh, so, you know, um, not much to say here. The longer it stays up here above this breakout level, 1960, the more likely this looks like it's loading up to take off. Today, it only traded 69,000 shares, but um, which, you know, you got to be careful in some of these, these commodity ETFs. You have to make sure they trade volume. So, you know, you, you can get in and out and you don't have to worry about, you know, big gaps uh, and the bid ask isn't wide so wide you drive a truck through it and uh, you just wonder why you got involved now if you dig down into companies that that produce this stuff it might be a better idea um, but i just wanted to show you the base that the base metals is on board that it got the memo um, the dbb got the memo uh, so let's let's look at a couple of other things that uh, at least to me are are interesting in this space and one is the Sprott, um, the Sprott Physical Gold and Silver Trust. Um, and you can see from this chart that this is a giant accumulation pattern followed by giant accumulation pattern 2013, 2020, Peak August of 2021. Uh, is that right? That can't be right. No, it's 2020. Sorry. Yeah. So that's two th that's a year ago, and for the past year, it has been in this uh, kind of like flag. And just the other day, a week and a half ago, it hit it hit a low. It broke the prior lows. Hit a hit a low at 1675 and it looked around down there and it didn't see any sellers. And here you have RSI, MACD starting to curl up. RSI shows a non-confirming low on the weekly, which is important, uh, which is, has teeth to it. 100 week MA is, is pointed up, the 200 week MA is pointed up. So this CEF, might be an option, you know, a an alternative for anyone wanting to be in gold and silver in the gold and silver space. It's physical gold and silver, which trades very differently than the paper markets, the the derivative markets like COMEX. And when the proverbial stuff hits the fan, and if gold and silver revalue higher and if the dollar gets clobbered gold and silver will be on that train maybe there may be the caboose on the train but they're going to be on that commodity train this could be all the way here now to me i have you know convoluted technical measurements that tell me it could go to 40 dollars but for now this up leg looks like it's a 26 to 28 target off of 17, off of this 17 low. So this might, CEF might be a real uh, alternative to be, have your kind of little toe in this space in the physical side in, a, in an equity instrument uh, that's part of your portfolio. Let's see, before I go over to the pot side, uh, what else do I wanna discuss? Uh, oh, here's, <laughs> I don't know if I have the chart here. I thought I put the chart here, but I wanted to show you this. Okay. Okay, this is the Globex Uranium ETF. Now, Uranium went bonkers a few weeks ago. Let me condense this chart. Let's see how far back this goes. It goes back to 2012. Now, this is one huge base. 
on on um, the uranium market. Now, uranium, like you probably said to yourself, what in the world is uranium? Well, we all know it's a nuclear material and without it, you can't produce uh, nuclear, nuclear energy. Well, it just so happens that it's a small market. And since um, the Biden administration is, is pushing the, you know, the non-fossil, non-fossil fuel alternatives to power this country up the road, nuclear power, as heinous as it is to some people, because it's nuclear and you got Three Mile Island, et cetera, et cetera to the, I think that the green, the green Revolution people are giving it a pass because it's clean and they hate fossil fuels so much that they're saying, okay, bring it on, more nuclear power plants. And if we can make them safer, all the better. Well, you have like a seven year base pattern in uranium that's starting to break out. And based on this chart, of course, there, there are lots of components in this sector. You might wanna check out NXE, and, uh, which is a company that produces uranium. Uh, this is an ETF that includes companies that are in the uranium space. Uh, you might want to check out uh, DNN, which is a miner in this space. But if you want to like not be beholden to any particular name, then check out something like URA. Uh, let's see what kind of volume it traded at a million and a half shares today, which is great. Um, and so this base, who knows where this could be, this base could go. I, I don't think you can really make a projection because uranium is in such tight supply and, you know, Sprott has put together a, uh, a fund and they have funding for it to buy up like a huge amount of whatever is available in the uranium space. So uh, the companies in this index, in this ETF that are producing the uranium are probably end, ending up contractually selling it to uh, Sprott. I don't know that, I'm just guessing, but it's a small space and small spaces in the commodity world tend to explode. Uh, and it's a two-edged sword. It may be that this thing, that this thing is a parabolic, that it, it goes to here and the next thing you know uh it's doing one of these but who knows it's a long way off and if nuclear catches on it's not going to do that it's going to do this right so so who knows but I just throw that out there because I consider it to be in the commodity space and it's uh, the supply demand issue is all about demand because there's not a lot of supply. Uh, and I don't know if it's one of these commodities where the more money you can throw at it, you know, there'll be demand destruction because like oil, because eventually they'll produce so much that, um, or the price will go so high that you won't be able to afford it. Well, that may be true at the gas pump, but uranium is another thing. So anyway, that's just another idea for you. All right. So I don't know who tuned in for, for my pot analysis or pot analysis, but uh, if gold and silver have been disappointing over the last few years, well, nothing compares to pot. <laughs> uh, Where's my Tilray chart? Uh, let's use Tilray as an example because Tilray, uh, I have another Tilray chart because Tilray uh, had, the, had the distinction 
of climbing to 300 right out of the blocks. Let me see if it's on, if I can get it on this chart. Yeah, it's there. Come on. All right, well, I'm going to get rid of, um, well, no, I shouldn't get rid of these indicators because I want to use them in a second. Okay, so here's the IPO in Tilray back here at like 20 bucks. And let's say that was a July of 2018 and it proceeded to go to 300. That was the exact high. Come on, where is it? There it is, $300. And that $300 price occurred, this is a daily chart. So it, it occurred on September 19th, 2018, almost exactly three years ago. And it has gone into quite the bear market since then, bear phase since then, with the exception of this period last year, when the Wall Street bets crowd got a hold of it and just jammed the shorts into kingdom come. Well, if that's, there, there, was, no, there was no fundamental support for this move. So here we are back again at $10. This high was 30, oh, oh no, it's almost 70, this high. Uh, which still was dwarfed by the post IPO run at 300. Now remember, the post IPO run was was everybody was all excited in the fourth quarter of 2018 because uh, there were all these kind of rumors that you know the attorney general was going to uh, remove pot from like the the list of narcotics that like compared it to uh, heroin and, and drugs like that, like, like real seriously uh, dependent drugs and, and removing it from that list, uh, I guess it was called a something one, a section one or a, I don't know. Schedule uh, one. Oh, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you're listening. Um, so uh, yeah. So, removed it from schedule one. So uh, however, those rumors were unfounded and we thought or it was thought that Trump, the Trump administration might, might legalize pot or loosen the screws a bit. So the federal government would, would get out of the way, but it didn't. And then Biden, the Biden administration comes in and everyone says, oh, they, this administration is completely the opposite and they're doing everything the opposite of Trump. So why not legalize pot? Well, that is so far on the back burner, unless it's on page 2022 of this uh, massive spending bill uh, snuck in there somewhere. No one, no one's heard a peep from the, uh, from the, the Cadmus crew in the, in the Capitol. So, so I don't know if, legislatively, we're going to see the light of day in pot. However, uh, today, I noticed that, and let me go over to my near-term chart of Tilray. Uh, today, I noticed that um, Tilray, now this is the Tilray uh, chart from where it hit $77 in February of 21. This was the Wall Street bets jam jam job. It's been going down ever since. But today, for the first time in a while, uh, I was told that uh, Tilray was very active in the Wall Street bets um, chat room. And in fact, for most of the day, it was like the number one discussion item. Now, I don't know if that means anything. And for heaven's sakes, if that's what we need to get Tilray to go up, well, that's a sad story. But uh, I'm not going to rest on those laurels. 
if there's a reason for me to be in Tilray or for me to be positive in Tilray, technically, I'm going for the ride. I'll, I'll, I want to be in there too. Why not? And I want my members and subscribers to know. So this structure in Tilray, let's, let's uh, widen it. So I, I look at this as a falling wedge pattern and falling wedges typically are ending patterns. They're the final, they're the final uh, configuration of a, of, a, of a bear move. Now, a rising wedge is the final configuration before a reversal in a bull market. In a bear market, a falling wedge is a bearish pattern, usually ends with a spike low and then a reversal. Now, wouldn't you know that today, pre-market, Tilray makes a new low, a multi-month low. You have to go all the way back to January of, Feb uh, January of 21 to, to, uh, to see a comparable low price. Down here, it takes out the 1060, 1080 area, goes to a new low, looks around and says, no, I don't think I'm going to fill the gap left behind way back here in January of 20, January 5th of this year. Why not? It was, a, it was an open invitation to go down to 950. Well, it stopped at 1040 and took off, went to 11, what was the high day? 1130, 1142. Tried to get through this, this 1135 re resistance zone, small one, but closed at 1103. Well, I don't know if it closed at 1103 or it's trading there. It's definitely trading there now, but uh, at, eh, it's, come on, 1600. It was, yeah, closed at 1102. So, um, yesterday's close was about 1070 or 1060, 1064, somewhere in there. So it had an upside reversal today after making a new multi-month low. And although it didn't break out, Tilray looks like it ended this falling wedge pattern with a spike, a classic spike to a new low, and then reversed. Now, I'm not going to get excited until it closes or it takes out this 10 this 1135 on a close and today's high at 10 at 1142 and then follows through above 11 above 1245 can you be in it here yeah with a stop under today's low can you be in calls yeah expect them to bleed to death if nothing happens um and do we sit around and pray that uh, wall street bets continues to uh, look at this one, I really don't know. Uh, there's no downside to that because if they don't come through, they don't come through and it goes back below 1040 and you stopped out or your calls bleed to death. And well, just know what you're getting into if you get into Tilray because uh, I don't know, they came out with earnings today and uh, the stock, I guess, performed okay. Uh, Tilray is making a little bit of money, but uh, it's a big disappointment and it's way below where it could be. The technicals, if there was nothing, if Wall Street Best wasn't around, the technicals say, yeah, take the shot because it's a falling wedge that looks like it was completed. And that typically is the final element of a bear phase, or it can be the final element of a bear phase. Okay, so we're getting late. I don't know if... Um, if you want me to do any more, but I'll do one more because in the pot space, because um, because I want you to see a bigger picture of something that's not Tilray, and that's not Canadian. Uh, so, so this is the uh, MJ, you know, ETF, and this is all an American product. And you can make the case technically 
since you've had multiple non-confirmations of down moves. So, I mean, here's where you made the momentum low, which is like crazy that you made it at uh, 17 bucks. And today we made a low at 14, but every successive low from the 17 low back, back in you know, mid, mid July, was every successive significant low was corresponded with a higher low in momentum. So what that tells us is that there's decreasing downward pressure. I can't say it's exhaustion because it, it, MJ hasn't been able to rally much, but it looks like it's in position to. So what does it have to do? It has to get over this stuff right here. So I would say this, like the white average there is the 17 day moving average. And the 10 day is the blue one right below it. And they're starting to flatten out. Maybe they'll start to turn up if MJ can hold this area 1430, 1450. But what it has to do, number one, is to take out today's high, which did fail to get through the 17 day MA and the high was at 1470. If it can get through 1470, then it, then it has this trend line that goes all the way back to June. And that comes through at pretty much at 1488, 90. Then, then things start to get interesting. But when things get really interesting in MJ is above 15 and a quarter. Uh, then I think, I will be saying that there's a low in place and MJ's in the grasp of a, of a uh, counter trend rally. Now, in that, MJ had this massive high. Of course, everything went with Wall Street bets and, and Tilray in February, and then everything tanked. So if you can get through resistance in the trend line at 15, 20, 25, then I think that there's real interest in this. Um, and it's in a turn. It won't go straight up unless Wall Street bets jams everyone, jams the shorts. However, what we can expect, I think, is a period without Wall Street bets or any craziness uh, that has nothing to do with natural progression of things. What we can expect is a base period. And that base period, it could take all the way out here into the end of the year. And you round, you round through, and then you've got something that, that, that looks like this, that can generate an up move, a base. So without shenanigans from you know the vigilantes uh, that jam this thing, I think that anybody who's in the pot space has to be prepared to see a base and to see catalysts that have to do with legislation and, and earnings build. Uh, and, you know, listen, the more pressure there is on the government to collect taxes, the more likely pot's going to be legal. So, and this administration, I think, is heading in that direction much more than the prior administration. So pot may be uh, in that commodity classification after all, um, but it needs a little bit of help. And that's the disclaimer on being in the pot space. You have to kind of hunker down. And if you get a Wall Street bet spike, take it, say thank you very much. But in the absence of one, be prepared to wait at least a while longer. At any rate, I've talked everyone blue in the face. So uh, let me see it, if there are some questions. Let me just see if uh, I can spend another three minutes. Let's see. And uh, all right, according to what we've done, wow, I interviewed there over the west side. I ended up going to bank. <laughs> okay, good. that's great. That's great. Well, Avi, you know that after Smith Barney, I went to Drexel and that was a real commodity place. Uh, and that was a fascinating each on the 16th floor, 60 broad, each desk, they had these trading desks and each desk was like a, uh, a five point desk. And there were five people sitting there trading and um, 
I was the roving technical analyst for all the desks. And I used to check in with each desk and the oil desk and the sugar desk and the cocoa desk. One day, real anecdotal story, quick. I went over to the coffee, sugar and cocoa desk. And I said, you know, cocoa looks like it's breaking out. And the head of the desk looked at me and said, why do you think that? I said, because my chart thinks so. So I said, uh, he said, well, we trade 40% of the world's cocoa from this desk. And I'll tell you one thing. We'll know before it, you do when it breaks out. And he, he looked at me and laughed and he said, no disrespect, but never trade cocoa because we're going to know if the elephants are running through the cocoa fields and trample the trample the trees way before you will. And that's just the way it is with coffee, cocoa, and sugar. So anyway, that was the disclaimer I never forgot. Uh, text alert services. Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, there, well, first of all, as far as um, um, my time horizons on individual stocks, I give you target prices. The target could be hit in three hours because that's how sensitive the work is, or it could take three weeks. Um, but in general, it goes from very short term to intermediate term. And there are people, uh, subscribers use whatever time frame is suitable to them. Um, uh, text alert services. Well, every time I put something out on the site, it is, you can have an automatic email sent to you to alert you. So I think that that's uh, equivalent to what you're talking about. Um, no, I was on the commodity floor at 60 Broad and that entire floor at Drexel was commodities, nothing else. Uh, and when they took, um, what's his name away? in handcuffs, not from our firm. Uh, <laughs> I, I just went blank. Um, right after that, in 1986, all the credit, a lot of credit lines were cut. So I would go to the crude desk and the crude desk would say, they just cut our credit lines. We don't know if we're gonna be in business in the next two weeks. I'd go to the other desk and they would tell me the same thing. So, um, uh, so that was an interesting time to be on the commodity floor because all their credit lines were being cut at Drexel uh, because of, um, of, oh God, I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> Probably the most famous. Ivan Boski. Ivan Boski. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. When they took Ivan away. Uh, anyway, uh, on that note, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. And uh, I thank you very much for showing up. I hope it was interesting. And uh, David, I thank you very much for inviting me.